Hi there, everyone. Hi everybody, welcome to uh, the session uh, on uh, discussing the issues around homosexuality, Qatar, World Cup and hopefully broadening it out slightly to include sports and how sports are dealing with um, the opportunities of inclusion I'd like to say I'd like to really focus on some positives uh, my name is my name is Genevieve Gordon Thompson I'm a uh, senior lecturer of law here at Democrat University uh, I am vice chair of the British Association for Sport and Law I run the uh, university's research um, center for sports law and I'm really pleased to have a fabulous panel put together for us today to talk to uh, first of all, we have uh, Nali Simakulwa, who is a freelance writer and journalist, uh, predominantly writing for um, media like Gay Times. That's right, Nali? Yep. Yeah, um, and I think it's going to have some really interesting um, points of view as we, as we go through the session. We also have Rory McGrath uh, with us today from... Solent University. Rory is an associate professor and has researched um, heavily in, in this particular area of, of topic of conversation today. And then last but by no means least is Alex Baker. Uh, Alex is the chair of Stonewall Football Club and he is president of the International Gay and Lesbian Football Association. So you should be able to have seen everybody's banners and if, um, if there's anything that you'd like to clarify then please don't hesitate to raise a question. You can post questions um, for us to answer at the end of the session. We are going to leave about 15 minutes for, for questions. But welcome everybody, thank you for joining me for, for this session. Um, and I'm really hoping that we can have an interesting uh, and um, considerate conversation uh, around the topics. And I know that some people will um, listening and perhaps find some of the some of the content quite painful for them in a, in a number of different ways. So when I was, I've, I've, stood, I've stood in for a colleague of mine actually, so I was sitting around thinking about doing some research. Um, my area uh, in this area is, is around duty of care to athletes and making sure from a legal perspective and making sure that uh, all athletes have a duty of care associated to them, but in a legal sense as opposed to in a moral sense. So I was doing some research and I was fascinated to learn that homosexuality is still uh, prohibited by law in 73 countries around the world. And when you put that into context of actually, we only have 193 countries, two recognized independent nations, but between that, you have a, you know, that's a third almost of countries that don't um, accept um, individuals to be who who they are and I just kind of really wanted to get a feel of, of your start point um, of, of, of how you feel the, the world is changing or perhaps is only changing in, in, in very certain areas. Um, Alex, can I ask you to just comment on and, and sort of set out your thought processes? Uh, sure. Um... So thank you for having me on the, the panel. It's great to talk about these um, great to talk about these things. I suppose one point to make is that uh, that we're, we're sat in a position in the West where there's been a lot of change, a lot of rapid social change over the last 10, 20 years. I, I came out in my mid 20s and it wasn't that long ago. And I think the context in which I came out was very different here in the UK than it is today. Um, 
and 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 so that's an important perspective i think when thinking about what's going on elsewhere in the world and and yes we can look at these other countries now and uh examine their laws and ask the question of whether or not that's right or not but but, but it's clear we've been on a journey uh, 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 uh as well um perhaps the only other point i'll make to to open is um uh some of these laws are because of our colonial past, uh, and we've left countries with them. There's a legacy and a, and a stain for this country in those um, in, in in those other countries. But clearly, if you identify as LGBTQ plus, it's quite painful to be in an environment where you can't be yourself by law, uh, where there are restrictions on your ability to associate. Um, to express yourself uh, and 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 so on, but I come back to where I started, which is the law is part of it, but there's also a sort of societal context and how people are treated and 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 so on. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, agree, agree. Uh, Rory, Rory, Rory. Have, have, have you got an opening comment that will, that will get us get us started, started as well? As well. Yes, um, I really would echo um, what Alex has has just said. Um, I thought there were some um, really interesting points there in, in terms of recognizing the cultural differences um, across the world. Um, and, um, and yeah, absolutely the, the point, of course, that, that so much uh, or so many of the countries where um, homosexuality remains illegal are, of course, sort of British kind of pre previous under British rule previously. And, um, you know, I just saw someone right not long ago, uh, you know, the, the, whilst the um, uh, British rule ended, the, the homophobia and the homophobic laws remained. Um, and uh, absolutely, I think the, the fact that there are um, so many countries, 73 countries across the world that um, are, are still sort of governed by those sort of archaic and draconian laws really indicate just how much of a... Um, uh, of a sort of a culture clash there is, particularly, of course, when it comes to um, these sort of mega events like, of course, the World, the World Cup that, um, that took place before Christmas, the Men's World Cup in Qatar. And I'm sure we'll come on to that a bit later, so I don't want to yeah. <laughs> jump the gun. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. And um, Yeah, so thinking about the global state of the policy around queer people, I think it's um, important to look at the effect that this is having on athletes as they try and um, as they try and both participate in sports and conduct their lives. And I think it's interesting if we look at the media's coverage of um, of the way of how queer athletes abroad are having to live. So I think Tom Daly produced a very interesting documentary with the BBC where he looked into what life is like for. Um, players and athletes in countries where it, homosexuality is restricted by law. And I think that what that shed a light on was the kind of difficult position that these um, athletes and players find themselves in because they're kind of caught between both culture and their home and the place they've grown up and then, the, and then their careers and their sports. So mm -hmm. I'm quite interested to look at how what sort of challenges they face in terms of their ability to live openly and to participate in their sport freely, but also mm -hmm. maintaining their own safety and feeling comfortable in order to, whilst mm -hmm. living authentically. And I guess, and I guess the, part, the culture is the, the, the different signals is going to come in and that, 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 that thought process. Because I think we've heard, heard, heard so many, so many things about rugby, 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 rugby and, and, and not not etc 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 and you can you can under, understand why why it becomes really hard or you really really, 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 really bad 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 actually as you say as you say you say use words 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 to get to get line line when the culture is so so um so so not the same and and 
Alex, Alex, we 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 do we 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 do 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 Sure, and I think I got that question, which is about my experience at the Qatar World Cup. So um, I, over the past few years, I've been very fortunate to be able to watch quite a lot of uh, England footballs. So that's the men's team, the Lionesses and the under 23s. And I had the opportunity to bid for some tickets for the Qatar World Cup. And I think any football fan uh, wanting to support their nation uh, should be able to go and enjoy uh, a World Cup. So, real spectacle um uh, a real fixture in the in 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 the football calendar so i took the decision uh, to go uh, as a fan um that's not a decision that a lot of lgbtq plus fans took I, there was uh, a lot of media attention around this in the run up to the world cup but a number of people for reasons that i really understand decided that um the hosting of the world cup in qatar wouldn't be a safe environment for them to attend I think there are also con some concerns, and this is the bit that often gets forgotten, about the impact on local LGBTQ plus Qataris in all of this. Uh, some football fans, some uh, not football fans, but that, that local LGBTQ plus population that, that, um, that obviously have an issue with the, the, the law being as it is in, in, in Qatar. But I decided to go, and part of the reason I decided to go was because FIFA made some assurances about the fan experience for gay fans attending. Okay. Uh, I, I I don't know how many gay fans went to the World Cup. I know very few talk about it publicly, um, but I did. And I can say that my experience wasn't that great. Um, and, and, and partly that was uh, the efforts the Qataris made in the run-up to the tournament to make it very clear um, that uh, they had certain cultural expectations around how people would conduct themselves in, in, in the country. Um, uh, but also my experiences on the ground. So I, 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 I didn't stay in Qatar. I flew in and out uh, for the matches. Um, and uh, within 90 minutes of landing for the Iran game, I, I'd i taken a flag. Uh, I, I thought it was important to try and express some solidarity. So I'd, I'd had a flag made up, pride flag without the colour in. So it was trained of, uh, of colour. So I had that and the T-shirt. And the T-shirt had the, uh, well, it was the No Pride Without All campaign, so a Twitter campaign that um, encouraged people to take the colour out of their avatars on, on social media, um, just to highlight the fact that um, this World Cup was taking place in a country where people weren't free to be themselves. And so I had the flag, I had the T-shirt and a small bag, and at the Iran game, I was uh, stopped by Qatari police at the, at the um, sort of airport style security that they had and uh, made to open my bag and although there was a language barrier it was quite clear that I wasn't getting into the stadium unless I put the flag in the bin and uh, I, I did have a discussion about the size of the flag and all of the dimensions and restrictions mm -hmm. that FIFA impose on, on taking these things into the stadium but it was very obvious that I was not getting in without putting the flag in the bin so there I had to put a piece of my identity in effect in the bin to get into the stadium and and that really set the tone for my experience in Qatar which wasn't which wasn't what I'd been led to believe by FIFA um I was also traveling on my own so there was sort of that question around how safe I felt generally and and I'd done I'd done I'd taken steps to ensure that I I had a bit of control over the environment I was in um and 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 so on but but I, I didn't feel particularly safe in the stadium environment and that was the key thing for me I'd structured my entire trip because I thought that would be the safest place, that FIFA-controlled domain uh, within within the World Cup. But as became clear to me across the tournament, the way that the stadium controllers, the local uh, Qatari police, implemented uh, policy was to quite aggressively, in my view, target people with any sort of rainbow um insignia on them so there were reports of watches of, of the hats that the welsh fans wore t-shirts um even news reporters where the logo of their news channel had some rainbow coloring on the, the there were so many stories of this type where people were um stopped and prevented from entering if they if they had 
these things. It became clear it was quite systematic targeting um, of, of a visual representation of the LGBTQ plus community. So uh, in summary, Genevieve, I, I don't know that it was the type of fun sort of life-affirming experience that a lot of fans expect from a Men's World Cup. But I thought it was important to go and to bring voice to the experience of gay fans at the tournament and in the hope that these sorts of considerations can be uh, reflected upon by by FIFA and the member associations in, in future tournaments. It, it's really, I mean, there are so many things that I could pick up on and, and ask questions about. So it, you weren't, you didn't stay you were flying in and out to go to the games, did you say? I... Yes, yeah, that's right. And look, mm -hmm. I was staying in uh, Dubai, which um, like the UAE does not have very forgiving laws to right. LGBTQ plus people. But, um, but, I, but, but people, people feel capable of traveling to Dubai in a way that uh, was slightly different to Qatar. Mm -hmm. The other context, which I think is important, is there was so much media attention in the run-up to the World Cup um, that it was it, it that there was a lot of focus on how you would be treated in Qatar if you turned up and you were gay in a way that I don't think the UAE has been subject to and and maybe I'm naive in this respect but I did feel more able to relax in Dubai than I did in Qatar the other factor is by the time I looked at accommodation there were these sort of porter cabins in the desert and when I was thinking about my own personal safety that wasn't uh that wasn't the idea of a a, a a a sort of safe experience for me so there were a lot of factors but yeah I try I flew in and out on match days um was that a normal choice for people in the LGBTQ community to to not stay in Qatar to live were people or were you the own, do you feel do you feel it was the norm or do you think feel it was your choice it's a, I kind of what I'm getting at was did you so the, have the, an understanding that that was a better place to be so I, I think with these things individuals have to make their own judgment about where they feel safe the the normal uh, approach for LGBTQ Q plus fans was not to go in the first place that was that was what most fans did okay. uh, i'm pretty sure there were um fans there that identify as lgbtq plus who may have stayed in the country but yeah. um kept their head down in the way yeah. that the qataris sort of suggested would be good for them um uh but but i i, I didn't feel comfortable staying and, and that's a personal choice for me um but equally there are there are non-lgbtq plus identifying fans who chose not to stay in qatar yeah. For different reasons, yeah. you know, there there were some broader reasons why that might have been a, a good choice. Well. <laughs> yeah, but but for me, it was partly a safety reason. Yeah. I just didn't want to spend more time in the country than I had to. Okay, um, Nally, if if I could come to you, so Alex was, uh, was mentioned the media there and how the how the stories unfold and and how the World Cup conversation went in the media. Could you just give us an understanding of, of what you see as the differences between the LGBTQ plus media outlets and perhaps a more, um, I don't really know a word that would be acceptable to me to say, not to, not to anyone else. But, but you, media. Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think um, recently you've seen this. We've seen like an increase in LGBTQ plus specialized media. So that's your outlets such as like Attitude, Gay Times, Pink News. Um, we've seen them taking more of an interest in LGBTQ plus sports issues, which I think is both emblematic of the diversification of their newsrooms and the 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 gens that they have on their rosters, and also. The fact that football is becoming an additional and other sports as well are becoming an additional site of positive lgbtq plus action um i think the differences that we see are mainly that these um specialized lgbtq plus outlets tend to give more of a voice to the um to queer players and queer athletes themselves and i think 
a reason that that happens is not um, is largely attributed to the fact that as queer athletes might decide to come out, which they are doing so in very small numbers, but as they choose to come out, they are more likely to align their story and trust um, queer and media sources with the telling of their stories because they feel that when they do sit down with a reporter or a journalist, they're speaking to someone with a similar understanding of what it is they're going through, someone who's likely to tell the story in a way that feels authentic and honest and is less likely potentially to um, sensationalise or even on a less extreme level, just is more likely to tell the story with a tone that comes from a place of empathy rather than an outside perspective. So I think that might be a reason why there is a bit more um, first-person coverage from mm. queer media sources. But I also think a large reason that we're seeing like, stories coming through certain channels and not others is due to the just the um, the state of the of queer players in the sport at the moment. I think um, there is a real shortage of queer um, people and faces that you can point out and identify and and are therefore able to tell their stories through these different media channels and I think that when they are present you do see all kind of media sources jump on them to get their perspective on the story like when you look at Ryan Atkin and he came out um, his his story was across all different sorts of media channels but yeah I think mainly the difference that I would say is that queer players and athletes are tending to go towards queer sources just out of trust and then the mainstream media kind of are left talking about or talking for LGBTQ plus athletes when they're because they're not coming out and they're not able to talk for themselves at the moment but I think there is a difference um I think there's nuances within that between men's and women's football, if we're looking at football, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, when I, when I look back and I think about the, the mainstream media that was around at the time, you're looking at the BBC, mm -hmm. um, some of the major tabloids. I remember, I know, I know Alex referenced the, the, the hats, the, the group of people that tried to get in with their hats um that was a big story but i'm just beginning to think okay there were a lot of stories that the mainstream media just didn't pick up on and didn't take any note of rory can i bring you into the conversation how yeah. how do you think we you you, you i mean you know you're a, a writer an academic you're you're sort of journeying through this through through this through the story and using writing to, to do so you've just um written a book that's about to be released how do you think writing should change to make sure it's there's more opportunity for people to just be themselves be who they are and not feel you know i'm sad to hear about words use the safety authenticity things like that how do you think your writing and what you're delivering to a more education market is going to help bring about change yeah good question um i think with respect to um some of the research that i've done and, and friends of mine have done and so on in this area it's um it is often sort of at odds with with what we hear about um, in terms of research outside of academia, for instance. Um, it, it's almost like a direct clash to some degree. Um, a, a lot of the research that I've done and some of the research, research that my colleagues have done and so on, you know, points towards this kind of cultural shift um, of, of attitudes. And I think that that is, um, that, that's most definitely something that, that's happened. You know, we have seen a, a a liberalization of attitudes certainly in the uk over the past few decades and we have started to see that in sport over the past um decade as well um but that of course is not a universal thing you know we know of course that um uh, both in the domestic game and internationally there are there remain a significant number of of issues and, and obviously um alex talked about the qatar world cup um and um, uh, and now he talked about 
the sort of low, relatively no, bleh, relatively low number of of out queer athletes um, at the elite level. So, um, I, I think in terms of you know answering your question directly, um, I'm not sure there's one singular answer. I think it's um, I, I think it's a really difficult question to answer um, in terms of what we do. I, th I think. Um, uh, you know, making sure that we are addressing issues effectively, certainly in terms of um, uh, if we think about some of the, um, you know, some of the topical things going on at the moment. Um, take a recent example in the domestic game. Obviously, we've seen this um, uh, increase of, of chanting, problematic chanting um, at, at matches involving um, uh, Chelsea fans being the the target of that chanting. I think education is is going to be key to that, um, and that's something that I think is, uh, is is you know as I said is kind of really important with respect to, um, to to making that change is to make sure that that education is there as to you know why that is so problematic and um, there's a lot of sort of resistance against that I think because that education is not there. So um, yeah, I, I think it's. I, you know, I'd be rabbiting on if I, if I carried on and on and on, but yeah, I think there's no one singular reason why, um, you know, there are issues still. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably a, a key thing to that. It's probably to, quite a, broad, a broad question to try and nail down an answer to, but it does, it does bring me on to thinking. Um, I, I highlighted Earlier today, uh, John Holmes, um, who at the time was a senior editor of Sky Sports, and um, he, he worked to create a rainbow ready pack, which I don't know if I've not seen one of these packs, but I was in, I was looking and reading, and I was interested to see a. Has anyone used the pack? Was it useful? Because it's specifically there to give media the confidence to report on inclusion um, in an effective way. So it, obviously John has said the pack was really well received, but I, I wonder, have, have, have any of you heard about the pack? Have any of you utilised the pack, seen the pack, to, to be able then to consider Nally and Rory's points about positive engagement and the utilization of the people you know there's no point about talking about the people if you're not talking to the people so has that rainbow pack been useful has that group that that john holmes set up the lgbtq plus media group been a useful um vehicle to to help us bring about change or do you i mean i i'm getting a sense nally that you'd say we're still a long long way off from effective journalism in this area? Yeah, so I think the, as far as have I ever personally used the pack, I haven't, but I don't know, I don't think I can attribute that much to being a fault of mm -hmm. the pack itself. I think um, the sports media, LGBT media group, I think it's definitely doing positive things in terms of bringing about, it, it's created a forum and a channel to kind of discuss these issues within sports media um, around LGBTQ issues, which I think is definitely positive as it's kind of centralised the discussion and it allows a place for the discussion to come through. I think in terms of the pack being um, widely useful, I think it's dependent on the state of football. I think if we look at the men's game, the reason that the pack might be less useful is because there is this um, lack of of queer players on which uh, media, communications, brands, agencies can work with and work around. Yeah. I think if we look at applying the principles that the pack introduces to the women's game, however, I think we can kind of see where it starts to become more useful as it's implemented. I think... Um, the women's game and the reporting around that and LGBTQ issues in the women's game, it tends to be, or has been, is, is much more open and is much more, um, it's much more of a dialogue between the players themselves, fans, and um, wider like media and other um, institutions who are responsible within it. And I think that that is due to the fact that the women's game has got this culture now of, um, 
but where players feel supported, they're able to come out. You have really outspoken and um, vibrant players, such as like Megan Rapino and Ali Ali Krieger and Ashton Harris, who um, have kind of created, almost cultivated a name and a brand for themselves in the fact that they are outspoken about queer issues and they're willing to talk about things like this. And with with the example of Ali Krieger and Ashton Harris, who are a married couple who both used to play for the US women's national team, they actually invited Vogue to cover their wedding. So that sort of thing, like what that does is it it allows LGBTQ plus players to control their own narratives and be a part of the telling of their own stories. So I think with things like that in the women's game, that kind of shows, um, it's kind of an exemplary show of what could happen for how media and other um, communications organisations tell the stories of queer players and how they're able to shape the narratives that surround LGBTQ plus athletes. And it, you, know, you know, it leads me on to thinking why what is it exactly that is stopping men being able to do and be exactly the same H how have women created it is it because of the time frame that we the, the lgbtq plus community has been at the forefront a lot more in the sense of less hiding let's let's start opening up the conversation so actually as, as the women's game has grown more recently and has received positive media positive communication out to the, to the mainstream it's actually enabled that that the the whole conversation to be a real conversation and i wonder you know alex do you feel that the men's game has been particularly restricted in the past um well look by reference to the women's game clearly it has um and i'm not saying this is a this is a good thing but just one observation given the way that women's football um has been administered in this country in the past is uh, it historically there was a lot less for people to lose in the women's game by being themselves there was more to gain you know I, I'm very firmly of the view that you, you get better athletes when people are able to bring their their whole selves to to what they're what they're doing but there, there wasn't the same you know historically there hasn't been the same interest the same commercial drivers the same investment in the women's game the uh, decision that you make as an individual as to whether or not you're open about this or not and what that means for your uh, likely career earnings you know that there's sort of some awful considerations that will come up in the in the men's game given how it's developed over time but the other thing to say is that culturally the men's game is in a very different place you know i don't know that there's a quick fix to this and it's not just about how the media reports on uh, the men's game although that's a factor it's also about you know what fans do when they're at games and the culture that develops in those groups if you look further down the pyramid the culture that exists in club structures and how they're they're run and uh whether or not uh, you know they create an environment uh, that is accept accepting and and where it is acceptable to be yourself but the culture isn't something you can change overnight you know this is this is something that takes a long time a long time to change and i do look on with some envy uh, other parts of the game where you see a lot more people who who aren't shading themselves where there's no duality they're, they're they're sort of they're able to express themselves fully in through their through their sports and and i hope in my lifetime the men game men's game gets there but there are a lot of reasons that go back decades as to why i think we're at uh at the position where we're at but there are green shoots you know clearly jake daniels um made a decision very early on his in his career that he could be open about who he was and that's what he wanted. And I really hope that the consequence of that is he has a more successful career than he would have because he doesn't need to worry about it. Um, and so I'm hoping we, we, we start to see more stories like that. The other thing to point out is in non-league, uh, increasingly we're finding people being comfortable and open about who they are in a way that perhaps would have been unthinkable 10 or 15 years ago. And I know at the sort of grassroots game um, where Stonewall FC plays, um, it's a lot easier for people to, you know, the grassroots game is a lot easier now than it was 20, 30 years ago when the club was set up. 
there is more acceptance and understanding but these things change over over uh, hopefully change over time so a general question to to all of you and please feel free free just everyone to chip in which sports do you think are a good example of providing inclusive opportunities to athletes not just you know i'm not just interested in professional orally i think we can very much bring in the the grassroots sports into the conversation because if you don't have that at the lower level i don't really see how you can provide opportunities at the the at the, the, the the more senior level so the sports that you think are demonstrating an inclusive opportunity rory do you have a particular sport that you you think is doing well i was dreading this question coming to me first because I know little, little about other sports other than football, and um, that, that's about it. A bit of a one-trick pony. But um, <laughs> what I would say is, um, I think football. I talk about football first. I, I think you know, um, it has, um, it has made. Um, you know, there have been changes in the game. Obviously, yeah, um, there are um, uh, many things that need to change still but i think it as alex said even 10 15 years ago things have um uh, sort of improved since since then mm. in terms of comparing it comparing it to other sports um i might have to defer to, to nelly or, or alex on that because um my knowledge of those sports is, is relatively few other than or relatively um light other than to say you know Clearly, there are still issues in football because um, we see so few um, out players in the men's game. Um, but um, you know, compared to say to some sports, um, so I would need to, to refer to the uh, to the other experts on the panel to be able to answer that better than me. I think. Okay, Nally, with yeah. your tennis hat on, <laughs> um, I think. If you look across the board at a lot of sports, there tends to be this kind of split down the middle where if you look at the women's um, game, there is more inclusion, there's more diversity, there's more representation of people of different sexualities, which isn't mirrored in the men's game. So I think women's basketball, in particular the WNBA League in America, um, is doing a lot in terms of diversity and inclusion. I think... It was Sue Bird who was um, just recently retired. She was Seattle Storm's point guard. She commented that um, women's basketball in the country in the USA is not as popular as other women's sports or as the men's game. And she marked that down to the increased diversity that women's sports enjoys. So there are more black and brown players on teams and there are a lot of um, openly queer players. And then the women themselves who play the sport tend to be like, taller physically bigger kind of less what you would see as um stereotypically feminine so i think that sort of those sort of comments and those sort of observations do mark that there are other sports that are kind of um paving the way for a broader um to be able to broader cultural attitudes towards gender and towards sexuality and i think it is most explicit in team sports i think across other sports and obviously if you look at boxing you've got Nicola Adams, who has an incredibly successful career and is quite openly queer. You have like um, Molly McCann, MMA fighter. You've got people like that who are visibly LGBTQ+. But I think in team sports, there's a different nuance that comes with the fact that they're not just seen as representatives of themselves as they kind of are when you look at more singular sports. They are kind of part of this... Um, ecosystem of their club their team their country mm -hmm. etc so i think yeah in terms of which other sports are exemplary i think women's basketball is quite comparable and then if you look on a grassroots level um there's been recent advancements in like football across the board with many more grassroots teams coming through that are specifically queer lgbtq plus focused teams and then also gaelic football is seeing um its first LGBT people's only team so that's kind of showing that the movement to bring more sexuality based inclusion and gender based inclusion within sports is expanding on a grassroots level across a variety of sports 
And Alex, I'm intrigued to know if, what your answer is going to be. And, I, and actually, I want to ask you a very about a very specific sport. So, uh, okay, oh, well, uh, look, I'm I'm like Rory, a one trick pony, and I'm not even very talented at football myself. So, I defer to Nali's view of sports. Okay. I'll answer the question in a different way, which is when I became chair of Stonewall Football Club. So, about five years ago, I had the um, belief that football was worse than a lot of sports in dealing with these issues and the only observation I'll make is um, over time I've come to the view that actually football is doing a lot of stuff it gets a lot of attention on these issues and I think that makes the gap of where we are and where we need to be really evident yeah. but um, particularly if you think about governing bodies uh, those who set the rules and regulations for the sport the engagement some of the leagues and so on. There's a lot more being done in football today than there was 10 years ago. And you can credit campaigns like Rainbow Laces for drawing attention to it. Uh, the work of a, a, a number of highly motivated individuals over a long period of time to, to get these issues on the on the radar. Um, so I think, I, I don't think, in relative terms, I don't think football is in as worse a position uh, as you might think even though there's a lot to do but some of the most interesting stuff is being done at grassroots level there's some really lovely uh, teams that exist some leagues that have been created our own club created a, a women and non-binary um, uh, section to it sort of 18 months ago and there are leagues like the goalpost league and clubs like uh, gold diggers fc uh, and so on and you you see what they're doing and um, you saw, I, I'm always impressed by seeing these these pockets. And the IGLFA has existed for 30 years. So you've had inclusive clubs across the world come together and compete um, to celebrate what football can be about for a long, long period of time. So I'm sort of optimistic that there's enough uh, individuals out there and motivation to, to, to create change. But in, in terms of relative comparisons with other sports, um, I think I defer to Nali on that. But you said you had a question about a specific sport. Well, yeah, I was so I was going to was going to ask about motorsport. Um, there, I don't know if you've heard of Racing Pride. Of uh, uh, um, so uh, Richard set up Racing Pride some time ago, and it's and he's actually that I think surprised himself at how quickly motorsport has engaged in the conversation in, in particular areas. And I wondered whether you had, had had any conversations and were offering support to a sport that I think would be seen by many to be not inclusive at all on many levels. Um, I know Nally was saying about um, some really prominent uh, individuals with, with within the LGBTQ plus environment and Charlie Martin is, is is one of one of those athletes that I think can go in the category, but um, uh, a, a a car a racing driver. So the question really was: Has how much is Stonewall assist? How much are groups coming to Stonewall and, and asking for help? And and I'm you know what's the footfall like? Back to back to you as an organisation asking you know offering support and help and have you seen that grow that that sort of support um so area? i should be clear about one thing stonewall football club and stonewall the charity are separate organizations we uh, obviously share a name which yeah. goes back to the the riots um back in the 1960s and yeah. although we have close relationships i'm going to struggle to talk about the great work that liz and others at stonewall but, are, are doing but what i can i mean John, for example, through his group, I, I, I know is engaged, Richard and Racing Pride. I've met Charlie, or uh, have been very impressed um, by her. Um, and I am a Formula One fan. So it's quite obvious when you look at the sport. And you're looking many, at Martin and the changes they're making. And yeah. When, when you look at the sport on many dimensions of diversity, it is significantly far behind some other sports that you can look at. Um, but I, I wonder whether or not part of the reason that Richard is getting some traction with that is that you have some drivers uh, at the elite of the sport who are who are encouraging a conversation about yeah. that at, at the highest level. And you do need those agents in, in, in sport. And this is a, to link it back to football. One of the issues that we have is there are no out or very few out male players, uh, mm -hmm. coaches, 
professionals at the top of the game that can help facilitate a conversation that is uh, grown up that is more enlightened sort of pure and stuff that you tend to get from time to time so what is it left to it's left to people who don't understand or don't know or are worried about uh, engaging the conversation in in a different way um but with motorsport having someone like lewis hamilton say look at this sport it needs to be different you know it's not good enough that um i'm the only black racing driver that's come to the elite end of the sport in its history we need better structures and so on you need people like that um who can credibly articulate why it's important to help um help encourage the the debate so when you were saying about the charity stonewall and football i would have thought people would come to the football club asking for advice and support um, do you know we, we we from time to time get in, but I mean, it's hard enough running <laughs> running an amateur football club without uh, giving out advice on how to how to um, how to do it. We get that from time to from time to time, but the context differs. You know, we yeah. we've developed we 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 understand and have experience of how to do it in the grassroots game of football. But I wouldn't mm -hmm. presume to know how best for people in other sports to engage. Yeah. But quite quite often, you do what what you do require the ingredients that sort of shift the debate along yeah. is having a governing body that is willing to engage with the idea and some individuals within it that are on board with having the conversation and the need for change and then you need some motivated people that that feel very keenly the the, the need to do something and they that that always helps okay um we we have just under 15 minutes left at our disposal and there's i i kind of just want to come back to to football um, a little bit. We we heard in 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 news reports that some of the LGBTQ plus community in Qatar were detained. What do you think FIFA's response to those detainments should have been, as opposed to what they were? Um, Rory, that does sound like a question that you could answer. Well, I think um, what we saw in the build-up to the to the World Cup in December was this. Um, sorry, in November and December was this sort of oh, we need to keep politics separate from sport. We need to keep it out of this World Cup. Um, and of course, ultimately, it was that that um, uh, that, that did fall for, uh, for for Harry Kane and for some of the other players who were, of course, going to wear the, uh, the, the One Love captain's armband. Um, whether we'll get on to the um, effects of that, I, I don't know. Um, I'd be interested to hear what people's kind of perspectives were on that. But, but nevertheless, FIFA obviously have this, um, this idea of, um, of, of keeping politics, politics out of football, um, which is, you know, impossible, right? Um, I also think it's fair um, to people just to say that most sports take that will we'll have that stance that that, yeah. that politics and, and the sport shouldn't cross. Mm -hmm. I, I know the FA has a lot of rules around. I mean, everyone knows about the FA and the poppy and all of those. You know, these different. So, football's not the only sport. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I mean, obviously, we're obviously talking about we're that. talking about football. Yeah, yeah. Questions about FIFA. So, so obviously, FIFA wanted to to have this sort of apolitical. Um, uh, situation with you know keeping everything out and of course there was that absolutely horribly tone deaf speech by um, uh, Infantino just before the tournament started about today he feels insert minority group here is just the most horrendous speech um, yeah. but but nevertheless um, I, I think it and, and then obviously what I was going to say earlier on actually and I wrote down some scribbled notes here about some of the things Alex was talking about with with um, uh, with his experience in the country was that there's this sort of typical experience where um uh, or, or situation where obviously fifa saying you know we're, everything's going to be fine um and uh you, you're gonna have, everything's going to be fine because it's the world cup and the the, the, the world's eyes are going to be on this tournament yet actually the experience of people like alex on the ground were far different um and so to me it was sort of like um <sighs> A typical kind of um, how much trust do we actually have in this governing body um, when they are saying things like that, and the actual experience you know, um, was was far different to, to what they promised. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, whether 
we trust FIFA that much anyway, um, for, for various reasons is another story. But I think um, certainly with situations like that, it was indicative of me of a governing body which um, which sort of falls well short of, of what we would really want them to, to do, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. and... Nally, do you have a view? Um, yeah, I don't think I am the best person to answer this question, but um, yeah, I'm going to pass on the question <laughs> because I don't think I'm informed enough. <laughs> to okay, so. you can. <laughs> so when when so Rory highlighting um, Infantino's speech, so I sent around a quote earlier on to you all um, that shape. Tamin said that how beautiful it is for people to put aside what divides them in order to celebrate their diversity and what brings them together at the same at the same time. So he he made that speech just after the the opening ceremony uh, when they were talking about Bedouin communities, um, and then I think the media kind of rolled this into a a wider conversation but I'm getting the sense that there really wasn't much diversity happening and inclusion happening on the ground in in Qatar um, at at the time of the games. I also think it's worth picking up on um, Infantino's statement saying the World Cup is the is was the best ever um, World Cup to date and that the West should actually be ashamed of lecturing Arab nations uh, because for 3,000 years or more, uh, the West has behaved appallingly. So I would, I, I would really like to hear some uh, responses to, to that statement. Um, and I'm happy for anybody that, that feels that they can... Go on then, Alex, you've unmuted yourself. Okay. I'll go first. Um, on, on that last point about it being the best ever, it depends what your success measures are. And if it's very narrowly, how much money FIFA has generated in its sort of four-year cycle between Russia and Qatar, if that is the metric, you can see why he might believe that. But if you have a view that you should judge the success of a Men's World Cup on a broader set of factors, then you may come to a different view. And in particular, if you believe that... Um, migrant worker rights, LGBTQ plus rights, women's rights are important, then it, it's hard to place the Qatar World Cup at the top of the at the top of the tree. Um, just on your on your point about the quote and diversity, in certain respects there 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 was a lot of diversity in Qatar. And so out on on the streets of Doha, the fans mixing together, as you would expect in a World Cup, bringing together a lot a lot of different people. The fact that they're you know the the support from Morocco, the fact it was hosted in a Middle Eastern country, um, that does bring a form of diversity to the World Cup that perhaps mm. had been under-indexed previously. So, so it, it's not true to say there there were none. But as a gay fan in Doha, I didn't feel particularly welcome, and it didn't feel to me like the Supreme Council wanted uh, the, you know that 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 identity to be represented in. In, in in any form uh, at, at the World Cup, so I, you know, I, I I think there are I think there are different ways of, of looking at it, and I can I can see how some with a different lens may may feel like it did demonstrate uh, a higher level of diversity. It's just with my lens, I don't think it did. In fact, I think it it it, it regressed. And I think for FIFA, the issue is: is it acceptable that any fan going to a World Cup? ends up being in a position where they don't feel safe or they can't support um, their, their, their nation. They get detained uh, for carrying insignia that's uh, perceived to be offensive. Um, you know, and, and that's where the debate needs to be located. And, and the one benefit I think we've got since 2012 and when it was awarded is um, the only rights in the bidding criteria and the bidding document for these World Cups back then were TV, media rights, the commercial rights, if you like, now in the bidding criteria there's more about human rights particularly migrant workers what i'd really like the legacy from this world cup to be is further change and more consideration about what is the fan experience like and this cuts both ways by the way i'm pretty sure we're going to have a discussion in 2020 
six about whether or not Ir Iranian fans can go and watch their team in the United States. There will be some other dimensions of this human rights debate that crop up. And I, I think we need a, a more enlightened way of, of, of dealing with it. Thank you. So we have, um, I, we've, we've had some questions coming in, um, but, and I'm just going to see what we can, what we can get through. Um, the first question, do you think the idea of toxic masculinity and the societal pressure on men to act a certain way has played a part in men's football being behind women's football in terms of inclusion? Yes. Simple answer. Well, yes. I, I think... Um, uh, and really, the, uh, was sort of communicating this earlier, so... Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, the, the answer to the question is in the question itself. Um, there is, the, the, the uh, I think, a, a certain pressure, a, a sort of a cultural pressure to... Um, uh, you know, to be a successful footballer, you, you have to embody certain traits, right? So I, I think, you know, the idea of straying away from these sort of stereotypes um, m m create these kind of potential problems um, uh, in, in terms of uh, inclusion. Um, and obviously, yes, in the men's game, there are, um, at least in this country, um, with the exception of Jake Daniels, no current out players, um, whereas of course in the women's game we know that that is um, that the opposite is, is, the, is the case as well. I think since we've been, what did you say, since we've been on air, since we've started, um, I don't know if any of you have picked up this story, a player in the Czech Republic who has played almost 50 times for the Czech Republic uh, for the men's national team has just come out and plays for Sparta Prague. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see the, um, uh, he's been supported by his club, um, it'll, be, it'll be really interesting to see the uh, the, the sort of uh, effects and long-term um, effects of um, of that, but it's uh, you know it's another really kind of big story really um, in terms of a uh, in terms of a, a gay male professional footballer coming out whilst still playing as well. And this guy's twenty seven, I think, as well. So he's sort of getting towards the peak of his career. So um, another big story and, and um, another really exciting story as well. Nally, do you think the age act? People, if there is a pattern in men's sport, it's I think that people that, that men feel more able to come out as they're getting to the end of their career. And I guess that that you know, Rory's just highlighted that that player in particular is 26, 27. Do you see that as a pattern as 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 men are progressing through? this concept of toxic masculinity is, is depleting as they have shaped their career already and then they can start saying who they really are. Um, I definitely do think there's a pattern in that male players tend to wait until after retirement mm. or as they're like approaching retirement to, um, to come out. I think that is partly to do with the fact that if they wait until they're no longer active players, whatever backlash that they might receive from fans has less of, a ch well, it has no chance of impacting their performance directly. So then whatever turmoil or whatever problems they may face as a result of coming out, if any, don't then have this impact on their career. Um, I'm not sure that I would ascribe it to toxic masculinity. I think that there is definitely potential there because, you know, it might be the fact that players are growing up within the, the throughout their careers and their, kind of unlearning old behaviours or becoming more open to things and then deciding to come out later on in life. But I would personally ascribe it to um, the fact that if you come out once you're retired, you've got your legacy affirmed. No one can kind of question your performance. There's no chance to be undermined and you are also able to live freely. In terms of toxic masculinity and the difference between the men's and women's games i think these ideas of gender also do tend to shape why the women's game is the way it is and why women are more able to come out i think that women athletes and um, particularly women playing traditionally masculine sports like football like basketball are already kind of performing these socially transgressive acts in terms of how they're subverting gender expectations. And there already is this overarching stereotype that many women athletes are queer anyway. 
So yeah. I feel like when women athletes and women players come out, it's less of a surprise. It's more, yeah. oh, we thought you were anyway type of yeah. thing. Yeah, I got that all the time when I was playing rugby. <laughs> but you're gay, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, um, so, yeah, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I, 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 we've run out of time. I kind of feel like we were just getting started. <laughs> we were just beginning to feel comfortable with one another. Um, so it's quite frustrating. Um, but thank you, everyone, for for joining me. Um, I'm I'm really pleased that hopefully we've opened up some conversations with for some of the people that were listening and that we were sensitive to the to the to the to the challenges that that lay ahead to to all sports and not least football and I have to say f football is trying I think in in you know there is a lot of good going on in football and I think sometimes we don't even shine a light on that so um but thank you uh, and I look forward to crossing paths with you all again sometime in the future Thank you. Thank you.